Well, good morning, Crossroads Community Church. Good to see all of you in the house. We've got some smiling faces. Nice to see you guys. It's been a while, but hey, look, you know what? Our God's a good God, amen? Come on, our God is a good God, amen? Amen. He's not just good, he's a great God, and he can make the darkness tremble. He can make the mountains tremble, amen? So let's come together in unison and let's make those mountains tremble this morning. Would you just give him a shout this morning? Jesus, 
Jesus, you're in this place. You're always working. Jesus. Even when we can't see it, you're working. Even when we can't feel it, you're working. Jesus, help us in our unbelief. Jesus. Even when 
working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You're the waymaker. The waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 Jesus. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. Jesus, we know that you're always there. You're working even when we can't see it, even when we can't feel it. In the storm, in the chaos, you're there. Jesus, we trust in you this morning. Jesus, for it is well with my soul. Jesus, you carried us to you chose us to carry your victory. And with that victory comes an unsurpassing peace. And we can let our hearts say, it is well.
that it is well with my soul because we know that you live within us you've gone before us you stand behind us Jesus there's the peace that comes with the victory and it is oh so sweet Jesus we thank you we thank you for your love we thank you that you persist after our own hearts Lord Jesus God's people said amen this morning amen so take a couple minutes here, greet one another from a distance with a smiling. whatever it is. Can we just show him specifically some appreciation this morning? Let's give it up for Lee. Thank you so much, Lee. I appreciate your flexibility in order to meet different state recommendations. Um, we've spread our numbers out in between two services, so thank you so much for being flexible with that. I want to make a couple announcements. Next week, everybody say, next week is Father's Day. And so I got together with our men's ministry uh, coordinator, Matt Russo, and uh, just sharing some ideas with him. And I, I don't think, Matt, I don't think you like took me seriously the first time. You're like, are you serious right now? Because Matt and I were having a conversation a couple weeks ago. We didn't even know if Father's Day, if we would be able to meet in the building, if we'd be able to meet on the property. And so as it started to come to, to pass that we were able to meet together um, I got together with Matt and I'm like, hey, you know, let's do something for Father's Day. I'm dying for some fellowship. Anybody else? I am dying for some fellowship. 
And so I talked to Matt and, uh, you know, he's like, what'd you have in mind? And I'm like, bro, are you ready for this? I'm like, I want to do a pig roast. So he kind of chuckles. He's like, seriously? And I'm like, yes, there are some things that are sacred that you don't joke about. And the pig roast is one of them. And so after talking to Matt, next week, we're doing a pig roast. And so make sure that you come out for that. Uh, yeah, give it up for pig roast. Come on now. So next week, we're going to have a full hog. Uh, Matt, Godspeed, man. Matt is going to be overseeing this thing get cooked the night before. Awesome. We'll be bringing it in. <laughs> We'll be bringing it in. I've had a couple of ladies come up and ask me, like, am I able to attend? I'm like, yes. This is a church-wide fellowship thing in honor of Father's Day, absolutely, but all are welcome. So I want to encourage you, come out, everybody say, next week, pig roast. Come on, say it with some, like, mm, pig roast. There it is. All right, all right. Um, as far as reopening details, as many of you know, there's a bill, H.R. 836, which is currently uh, going back and forth between House and Senate and courts. And this bill is going to radically change the way that we've been doing life over the past couple months. What this bill says is basically the uh, red, yellow, and green phase, they're going to get this bill, if passed, is going to get rid of all of that. And we're going to go back to not the new normal, but the normal how we knew normal a couple months ago. Did you follow that? Everybody okay? All right. So uh, I, I can't clap, but I want to. Um, so with that, uh, we'll, we're going to keep you up to date as best we can on how that affects us as a church. Still going through some uh, cleanliness protocols, absolutely. But basically what that might um, enable us to do is get rid of two services sooner so that we'd be able to meet under one roof, under one service. Are you ready for the Word of God this morning? Come on. I know our first service, we had a little bit more in attendance and they were a holler back. Don't be known as the quiet, chosen, frozen service. All right. Are you ready for the word of God this morning? All right. Just making sure we're not Baptocostal today, but we're Pentecostal. So with that, we're into this series titled Roar. Everybody say Roar. Roar. This series is founded on the belief that revival has a sound. I don't know if it's something that you've ever thought about, but I know most certainly from firsthand experience, revival has a sound, and it's much like a roar. And where I get that belief from is having been a full-time youth pastor for seven to eight years, I had the honor and privilege of going to different youth functions where teens responded to altar calls. And can I tell you that when teens respond to altar calls, one of the things that I love about young people is that they let it all out. They're just passionate. And I remember there was, there was these different moments in time where I had the opportunity to kind of help pray over students at the altar. And there's hundreds of students. Just imagine a sea of students that you're kind of, you know, stepping over people and walking over here and praying for however the Holy Spirit leads you and whoever the Holy Spirit leads you to pray over. And as I'm maneuvering this, there's, a, there's an audible noise that is coming out of this altar time. And it's much like a roar. It's the sound of teens crying out. It's the sound of them coming back to know the Lord or maybe giving their hearts for the first time. It's, it's a roar. Have you ever noticed how when there's a large gathering of people and they're all talking, it sounds like a roar? No, just you, pastor. Okay. And so I remember going to this convention and at this convention, it was a very special altar moment. Because as this pastor began to preach a message and as he's preaching the word of God, and I remember his theme was talking about a remnant, how in the last days there'll be a remnant that are, that's just going to shake the world, that's going to change the nation as we know it. And as he's preaching this message, he never gave an altar call. But halfway through his sermon, hundreds of teens start responding to the altar. Hundreds turns into thousands. And soon this, this entire floor area of the Hershey Giant Center is shoulder to shoulder with teens who are crying out to God. And there was a noticeable noise that day. It was not quiet. It was a roar. It was the sound of thousands of teens crying out, calling on the Lord, being baptized in the Holy Spirit, coming to know the Lord, giving their lives in surrender, being called into the missions field, being called into full-time ministry, saying, you know what, I'm going to have a secular job, but I'm going to give it all to the Lord. And all of these prayers welling up inside of this generation and shouting it out, the noise was an audible roar. 
I believe that the body of Christ, the church, has a sound. And that it's much like a roar. You know that you and I have a voice. And in recent years, I don't think it comes as any surprise to us. Culture's not happy when the church has a voice. Culture's not pleased when the church has a roar. I don't think it comes as any surprise to us this morning that often truth is labeled as hate speech. And while I recognize that you and I must give truth in love, because there's a vast difference between somebody being offended by what we said versus how we said it. And anytime you see a Christian who's holding a sign somewhere in a, in a city or outside of an abortion clinic and they have a sign that says you're going to hell, friend, that's not effective, nor is it biblical. Because the scriptures that I see is it says that the, the Son of Man, the Savior, the Messiah, was found sitting at the table with sinners. Come on, somebody. Truth and love go hand in hand, but love does not neglect truth. And you and I are called to speak truth. And in a day and age where truth is labeled as hate speech, I have noticed that the church of the United States of America has backed off. I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want to give my perspective because it's going to be offensive. Friend, we're living in a time where truth is going to be labeled as offensive. And it becomes that much more demanding that we give truth in love, but love does not give us a license to neglect the conversation at hand. Is there anybody hearing this this morning? There's a sound that comes out of the church, much like a roar. And this morning, I'm going to talk to you about prayer because prayer restores the roar and the voice of the church. You'll notice, I love the way that Mark Batterson said it when he said that prayer is the prerequisite to revival. Somebody, come on. Prayer is the prerequisite to revival. If we want to be an effective church, we have to be a praying church. If we want to be an empowered church, we must first be a praying church. Prayer restores the voice of the church. The revival that took place that shaped and formed the Assemblies of God, our denomination and fellowship, took place in an upper prayer room where hundreds turned into thousands, thousands turned into hundreds of thousands, and soon a worldwide movement took place where to this day there are more than 90 million people in the assemblies of God. But it started with prayer. Where you are sitting this morning, you're sitting on an answer to prayer. Because I hear testimonies all the time of individuals who attend our church and live in the community, and they say, you know what, Pastor? I prayed for years that there would be a Pentecostal Holy Spirit empowered church in Foglesville. You're sitting on an answer of prayer. As a matter of fact, I heard testimonies of individuals. You're kind of like the OGs of the congregation. You've been here since the days when we met in this school. You've been here since the beginning. And I hear stories of how you used to sit in a school auditorium praying that we would have a building today. You're sitting on an answered prayer. I heard prayers about how I hope that we would have a kid's space designated for them. Your kids are currently experiencing answered prayers. Prayer works. Prayer's powerful. But I believe that it's one of the most undermined gifts that we have as a church. What is prayer? Sometimes you and I have to discuss what something isn't before we discuss what it is. Because discussing what it isn't gives us a better picture whenever we arrive at discussing what it is. So here's what prayer is not. Prayer is not bargaining with God. I would also argue with that that prayer is not begging God. It's not asking for the scraps Lord, if you have time. Prayer is not begging. Prayer is not making demands of God. Prayer is not only asking God for things. Prayer is much more than a therapeutic, meditating type of exercise. Prayer is not bothering God and taking up His time. 
Prayer is not a way to control God. I want to say that again. Because sometimes in a Pentecostal background, which I feel like I can say this because I grew up in the, in the home of a Pentecostal pastor, what I have seen often is Christians kind of misconstrue prayer into thinking that I can demand God and tell Him what He's going to do. That is not prayer. Prayer is not a way to control God. As a matter of fact, I heard a story once of a little boy named Johnny. And Johnny wanted a bike. And so Johnny was discussing with his mom the kind of bike that he wanted. He said, Mom, I want this bike. And the mom just kind of looked at him and said, Well, why don't you pray about it? Why don't you pray about it and see what happens? So every night before bed, Johnny would go over to his bed and he would stand there and he would pray. And on night one, he stands there and he prays and he says, Lord, I really need a bike. I believe you want me to have a bike. So Tomorrow morning, when I check the front door, may there be a beautiful red bike. Hallelujah, amen. He goes to bed. So the next day, Johnny wakes up crushed. As he opens the door, there's no bike. So all day long, he's frustrated. This is kind of weighing on the poor little boy's spirit. He's like, God, I, I told you, I, I prayed, and my mom said, to, and I'm here So later that night, even though he was frustrated and kind of heartbroken, he sat there and he said, Lord, I need you to come through on this. I need a bike. So I pray and I want to tell you, give me a bike. And tomorrow when I open that door, I want to see a red bike. Hallelujah. Amen. The next day, he was pretty ticked whenever he opened the door and there was no bike. So all day long, his anger and frustration is growing more and more and more. And his mom's watching his behavior, and he's just frustrated and kind of upset with God. So finally, that, that night, Johnny walks into his room, and he sits down at the bed, and he couldn't find the words to speak. He says, God, I, 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 Lord, if, if, if you... Finally, his mother watches him get up, and he runs into the living room. He comes back with a decoration that they had in the living room, a statue of Mary, and throws it in the closet. He sits down at the bed and he goes, Lord, if you ever want to see your mother again. (laughs) Prayer is not a way that we make demands to God and tell him what he's going to do. And it certainly isn't a hostage situation. (laughs) Prayer is much more. Amen? Prayer is not a way that we show off one's spiritual maturity or intellect. Prayer is much more. In just a moment, I'm going to ask you to turn to Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 13. That's Matthew chapter 6. If you don't have your Bible with you this morning, we'll pray for a deliverance uh, at the end of the service. Just kidding. We'll have it available on our PowerPoint. But this prayer is known as the Lord's Prayer. And what I find interesting about that is Jesus in this moment was teaching the disciples how to pray. And sometimes we overlook that fact because we say, oh, it's the Lord's Prayer, as if Jesus was learning how to pray in this moment. That wasn't it. Jesus in this moment, after finishing answering some questions from the disciples on what prayer is and what it isn't, Jesus says, this is how you should pray. And this prayer can, in many ways, be titled the disciples' prayer or the disciples' teachable moment. Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 13 says this, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Don't be like them. 
For your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us of our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For just a moment, I want to pause and analyze this prayer. I remember taking a theology class my freshman year in college. And we studied this prayer, and it was in that moment that I came to realize that we could do a six-month series just repeating this prayer every week, looking at the theological implications But today, I want to talk a little bit about the behavioral implications. Jesus, as he went through this prayer, was not just giving them a script. How many of you have ever heard this prayer used as a script? Right? Where we just kind of say, we don't think about the meaning behind it. And often children, this is one of their first prayers that they learn. But we never pause and look at the lessons that Jesus is teaching us. That's what I want to do just for a couple minutes. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Jesus is pointing out that we need to lift up one's mind in order, or excuse me, and heart to God in thanksgiving. And by doing this, Jesus is teaching us worship and reverence towards God. There's something profound when you and I begin our prayers with recognizing the sovereignty of God. Amen? When you and I pause before we enter into prayer and reflect on His majesty, His omnipotence, His all-knowing power, His mighty hand, when we look at the authority of God, I promise you it will impact the way that you pray when you pause and reflect on His glory. Your kingdom come. Jesus teaches us that it's acceptable to make requests. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus teaches us in this line, submission and intercession. Give us today our daily bread. Jesus teaches us that it is acceptable to request things to the Lord, but it is also a teaching moment where he teaches us to trust in faith and in provision for tomorrow into God's hands. And forgive us of our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Jesus is teaching us the principle of repentance and forgiving others. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Jesus is teaching spiritual strength and the empowerment that we find in prayer. And these are lessons that we can learn on a surface level. And sometimes we can become overwhelmed. For example, there's the Bible verse that says, and he wept. And it's one of the shortest Bible verses that we can find, but the theological implications that we can talk about within that verse are, is, is an extensive list. And sometimes whenever we, we study something that Jesus is teaching us, it can be overwhelming. You mean, Lord, I got to pray all of this every time I come to you. And that's a lot to remember, Lord. But thank God for grace. Because the overall lesson when Jesus teaches this is this point. Prayer is communicating to God. Prayer is communicating to God. Prayer is simple enough that we can teach our infant children how to do it, and yet it is complex enough to take up the entire lifetime of theologians and philosophers. Prayer is a beautiful gift that you and I have. But why? Why do we pray? Why do we gather here and spend an extensive amount of time praying? Why do we have prayer nights on Wednesdays? Why do we believe in intercessory prayer? Why do we have altar moments where we have the laying on of hands and we believe for healings? Why pray? Famous Christian apologist Ravi Zacharias said this, the day that you believe your prayer life is the most critical part of your spiritual life, your life will dramatically change. 
I'm going to read that one more time. The day that you believe your prayer life is the most critical part of your spiritual life, your life will dramatically change. Why is prayer critical to our spiritual life? What does prayer do? Well, first there's this. Prayer enables us to see the way that God sees things. Prayer gives us a perspective. Prayer gives us a new advantage point. To my outdoorsmen who are here today, you know how crucial that is, right? When hunting season comes rolling around, you'll often see men walking through the woods, eyeing up different trees for their tree stands. Why? Because they want the point of advantage. They don't want any blind spots. Prayer in similar ways gives us a point of advantage. Prayer gives us a new perspective. Why? Because we're seeing things the way that God sees them. Secondly, prayer enables us to see our heart how God sees it. There are things that are in our hearts. It's like when David said, and you'll forever hear me quote this scripture when he says, you know, Lord, I want you to to reveal the things in me. I want you to look into my heart. Why is that? Is because David was saying, you know more about my heart's condition than I do. And so when he reached out to the Lord in prayer, when he wrote this psalm, he was saying, basically he was teaching us this lesson that, that prayer allows us to see into our lives like how God does. And that's another perspective that we have to have in our spiritual growth. Amen, church? Why pray? Because it reminds us of our humanity. Recognizing humanity in somebody else is a beautiful thing. And I find it ironic that we're talking about recognizing humanity in somebody else amongst all of the racial tension that is simply pleading and begging for everybody to see humanity for humanity, equally. But our prayer allows us, it gives us the perspective that our enemies are humans. That they were made in God's image just like you and I. One of the most beautiful stories that I, can, that, that I heard of one time was the Christmas truce of 1914. It's this true story that in World War I, British, British soldiers were on one side in the trenches. German soldiers were on the other side of the trenches. And in the middle, you had something called no man's land. This is where everything died. It was under constant enemy fire. It was under constant bombing. As a matter of fact, there are still to this day different areas, no man's land, that we still cannot go into because whenever it rains, the poisonous gases from how much they threw at each other seeps up out of the ground and can still to this day kill you. And in this no man land, on, on, on Christmas Eve, British soldiers paused because they heard Germans singing Christmas carols. And as they looked, they saw them lighting candles and singing Christmas carols. And as this event would teach us, in that moment, the soldiers saw something. Humanity. Where their enemy was no longer looked at through the lens of, that's my enemy, I have to kill them. But they recognized that's a person created like you and me. And as the story unfolds, these Soldiers come out of the trenches and meet in the middle. And they exchanged gifts. And they sang Christmas carols together. And as the story would tell us, there's different legends of even these two sworn enemies having a soccer game in the middle of no man's land together on Christmas Eve. I kid you not. What happened? They saw humanity in their enemy. Friend, what would our personal interactions look like today with somebody who had differing uh, political stances than us if we recognize their humanity? What would our spiritual life, our evangelistic life, what would that look like if we recognize that people that we pray for, maybe even pray against in some circumstances, that there's humanity that needs to be recognized. You know that this event opened up the eyes of these soldiers so much so that from the top, the, the top of the chain of, uh, of command, they had to send orders down to remove the soldiers because at that point they refused 
to fight one another. What happened? They recognized humanity. You're like me. We share something that we were all created by God. Prayer allows us to see humanity even in our enemies. Prayer causes us to recognize that we can't solve all of the world's problems and it enables us to see God's sovereignty. Matthew chapter 19 verse 26 teaches us that. By seeing what prayer does, we can see that God molds us and shapes us in moments and in times of prayer. There's revelation moments ha that happen where you receive a thought or an image that was not produced by you, but it was the Holy Spirit in that moment of prayer. Prayer is powerful. Come on, somebody. Prayer is powerful. Acts 4.31 says this, After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. After they prayed, the place where they were was shaken. That's not a coincidence. You could also read it this way. After, as a result of their prayer, the place was shaken. Prayer is powerful. Prayer brings about reconciliation between man and God. When you and I call out, when you and I repent, there's a reconciliation that happens where we come back into fellowship with God. That's a powerful moment, friend. Prayer is relational. We come to know God and more about Him and the character of God when we pray to Him. Why? Because just like my wife and I have conversations, when you have conversations with God, you get to know more about Him. Prayer is also submission. It helps us submit to the will of God. We see this in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus was there and he said, Lord, if it be your will, may this cup pass before me. Notice that Jesus didn't take on the persona of Johnny and say, Lord, if you ever want me to. He said, if it be your will. Prayer helps us submit to whatever his sovereign will is. And prayer is worship. It honors God when we do it. So why pray? Mike, would you come? Why pray? A simple answer would be this. Jesus did it. Do you need more? When Jesus does something, we're supposed to follow suit. We're supposed to become more like him. So if Jesus did it, then we should just do it, right? Mark chapter 1, verse 35, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Now, I want us to pause for just a second, because there's some realities that I want us to consider. The day begins in the Middle East around 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. Daylight is at 5.30 a.m. Jesus went and prayed long before daylight. So biblical scholars guess that he was up in the morning and praying at 4 a.m., in the verses to follow this, the disciples come and get him, and the scripture says, as the day had already begun. Well, we know that the work days start around between 7 a.m., 8 a.m., so we can, we can guess this, that Jesus was in prayer before the day began, two to four hours. Now, follow me with this. In the scriptures to follow this passage, the disciples come and get him, and they find him praying. As we read this interaction, we see the disciples ask him, you know, what do you want to do? And Jesus says, let's go do ministry, man. 
And immediately on this same morning where this verse is out of, they find Jesus praying. He was up around 4 a.m. They come and get him around 7, 8 a.m. They go out. Here's what happens following his prayer life. After he prayed, he and the disciples went to Galilee and drove out demons. Preaching and proclaiming the gospel and healings took place. Before healings took place, where was Jesus? Say it out loud. Before signs and wonders happened, where was Jesus? Before supernatural power and authority took place to kick demons out of people, where was Jesus? Could it be that Jesus was not just teaching his disciples a point and a lesson when they came to find him that morning? But he was trying to teach us as the body of Christ a lesson as well. I don't find it coincidence that he walked in supernatural power and authority that he's given to us, by the way. And before this supernatural power and authority was exercised, he was praying. How many of us approach dire circumstances and we don't begin praying until we've arrived at the situation? We don't begin taking a hold of that power and that authority until we're already there. But then there's Jesus. This leads me to my last point with you this morning. Prayer is a powerful weapon. 2 Timothy 1.7 For God gave us a spirit not of fear but of power and love and self-control. Here's what I've come to realize with this verse. You and I often focus on what God didn't give us and we neglect what he did give us. You and I will read this verse and we'll say he didn't give me a spirit of fear. Amen. So anyways but we neglect that he gave us things instead of a spirit of fear. Did you catch that? He said, no, 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 no. I didn't give you fear. Rather than giving you fear, I gave you power and love and self-control. And here's how profound these things are that he gives us in place of, of fear. Fear often leads us to do what? Doubt. Fear often leads us to be overcome by anxiety. Jesus says, I'll give you power to overcome the doubt and the anxiety. Power in this Bible verse can be defined like this. The ability to do powerful deeds and miracles, marvelous works. Power in this scripture, when we look at the original biblical languages, teaches us this, that this word here, power, means the ability to direct or influence the behavior of others. Wow. Prayer. And excuse me, power in this moment also means this. To direct or influence the behavior of others or the course of events. I would say we need that now in our nation, now more than ever. You've been given power. He also gives us love instead of fear. Love comes from the all-powerful, all-knowing God, the God who created all that we know and all the things that we don't know. He gives us this special kind of love. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7, this is what love does. Love is patient and kind. How many of you know that when we're fearful, how many of you are patient when you're fearful too? Not me. That's why I believe this is included in the list of things that he gave us to overcome fear. Because love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoings, but it rejoices in truth. Love bears all things and believes in all things and hopes in all things and endures in all things. God gives us perfect love and when we have His love living in us and through us, Fear is diminished. Perfect love casts out all fear. Thirdly, we get self-control. 
authority over whatever enters our thoughts and what we allow to speak in and through our lives. When we're fearful, we neglect self-control. That's why this is so beautiful. Because in our day and age, we go from one panicked thought to another. And once we absorb this panic thought, we focus on another panic thought and so on and so forth. And make no mistake, this is the media's agenda. If they can keep you in a fearful mood, if they can keep your mind in a fearful state, then they have your attention. And when you and I become fearful, we don't react in rational ways. As a matter of fact, we act irrational. Psychology would say it's called fight or flight. It neglects wisdom. It neglects a healthy train of thought. Fear promotes all of this craziness. It's kind of like, just. I want us to just pause and notice how beautiful this is. It's kind of like our Savior knew the Creator and said, I recognize that when you're overcome with fear that it's going to be difficult for you to love somebody. It's going to be difficult for you to be patient. It's like he recognized that when we are overcome with fear, that we see how finite we are, and we become self-absorbed into our finite world, neglecting the supernatural power that he gives us. It's kind of like he knew that whenever we were fearful, we would not react in self-control, but we would be out of control. So that is why it is so beautiful in this verse that he says, I didn't give you fear. I gave you power and love and self-control. We don't have self-control when we're fearful. As a matter of fact, our thoughts often race to the worst case scenario. So much so that we somehow believe that being a pessimist is a fruit of the Spirit. Can I be honest this morning? Sorry. We become pessimists. When we're fearful, we neglect to see His righteousness. And when all we focus on is the unrighteousness in the world around us. But He says, I give you self-control. God has given us a sound mind. And this scripture, self-control is the Greek word sozo, which means to deliver, protect, and keep safe. Because of this, we have the ability to think correctly. You've been given power. And make no mistake that prayer allows the church to roar. And friend, now more than ever, our culture needs a roaring church. Come on, somebody. Our culture needs a praying church. Why? Because a praying church is an empowered church. And as I shared with first service, man, I don't mean to be arrogant or rude in any bold statements, but last week after our service concluded, I just looked to Mike and Mike kind of gave me the look like, what was that? And I just smiled at him and I just said, Mike, the Holy Spirit stirring up in a righteous anger in me, man. And all I could say to Mike is, I'm done. I'm done being told to be quiet. I'm done being told by the world what is righteous and what is moral. I'm done keeping my mouth shut. I'm done having God's truth be labeled as hate speech. I'm done. I can no longer remain silent and I believe that the Lord is stirring up wells of revival in our nation. And he's calling us to speak truth in love. And I just want to be clear with you this morning. As we conclude, can I, can I share a, a few personal dreams of mine? Is that okay with you? Last week, I made a couple statements about abortion. I believe that abortion is wrong and is sinful. And I believe that 900,000 babies being killed every year is something that should grab our attention and grip our hearts. Recently in a discussion with an individual in regards to abortion who had some questions about my stance. 
they said, Pastor, I don't believe that the church is pro-life. I believe they're pro-birth. And I said, could you define that a little bit for me? He said, once the baby's born, the church doesn't care. Sometimes your critics will give you the most honest truth. And as I sat there, I said, you're right. We not only have to be pro-birth, but we have to be pro-life. What does that look like, pastor? It looks like us having a plan for the baby that we believe in saving. Can I tell you some of my dreams this morning? That the only way they're going to happen is if there's a big God behind them. It's my dream that someday C3 would run an adoption agency where we have something to offer to mothers who are contemplating abortion, where we can not only say, no, don't do this, stop, but we can also add in the conversation because I know of a family that would love to adopt your baby. I heard of a ministry recently called Zoe Ministry and this this ministry, they not only do something similar to this in the most beautiful, beautiful mission mindset, they not only take the babies and find adoptive families for them, but they also have counseling services available to the birth mother. And the founder of this ministry stepped back. He said, the reason why we do this is because I know that someday my son who I adopted is going to come to me and not only ask, not only ask, why did you take care of me? But he's going to ask the question, how did you take care of my mother? And I want to be able to give him a substantial answer. Friend, I want it here. I want to be able to not only show the world that I believe in truth. Come on, somebody but I also believe in love. And too often we neglect love and we're all about truth. Well, pastor, that's just who I am. That phrase is a license to say whatever you want without love. It is time for the church to rise up in truth and love. And friends, it starts with prayer dreams and visions and wants and needs. It all starts with prayer. Our country needs prayer. And before we, be, before we become concerned about getting prayer back into the schools, can we first become concerned about getting prayer back into the churches? Our churches need prayer. Would you stand up across this place? I'm going to ask that every head be bowed and every eye closed. It would feel hypocritical to end this service without putting it into action. And so if you're comfortable with this, in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to lift your hands up in the air. Why do we do that, Pastor? Because it's an outward expression of an inward experience. When we lift our hands, it is an outward sign saying, I don't care who sees. Devil, you just take a a seat right there in front of me and watch me worship my God. It has that kind of authority. So in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to lift up your hands, symbolizing what's happening inside. I don't want to peer pressure anyone into this. If you're not comfortable with that, So be it. That's fine. But in a moment, I'm going to ask you to lift your hands. And I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer. And then we're going to listen for a second. And I want to warn you, this is a dangerous prayer. Because when you mean it, God God has a tendency to shake people who pray things like this. God has a tendency to wreck us internally. He gives us convictions to stop doing things, but also start doing things. And I want you to kind of brace yourself. In just a moment, I'm going to ask you to lift your hands up in there, and I'm going to ask you to say this prayer with our hearts behind it, of course. If you're willing to take up the initiative, I'm going to ask you to pray the words, Lord, would you speak to me? Because God has a way of speaking to us and putting things in us and instilling things in our hearts that we never could have had unless He intervened. So with nobody looking around, if you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, 
I'm crazy enough to get after it. I'm ready to live this Christian life thing out in an adventurous kind of way. If that's you this morning, would you lift your hands up right now in this place and in your own words say, Lord, would you speak to me? You'll find that God, the way that he speaks is he'll instill ideas in your minds. Right now, some of you are getting images of maybe past mistakes you've made. And God says, I want to correct that in you. Right now, some of you are receiving images of dreams that he's given you or things that you need to live up to, things that you need to change, things that you need his help with, whatever it may be. I want you to just focus in on that. Holy Spirit, have your way. Right now, the Holy Spirit, I believe, is softening some of your hearts. Lean into that. Lean into that. Ask Him, Lord, who do you want me to be? What can I do for you? And before we close, I'm also going to ask you to, to, to say this prayer with your heart behind it, of course. We're no longer going to pray for revival to happen in this kind of ambiguous statement. I'm going to ask you to make it personal. If you're ready for the task, would you ask him right now with your hands lifted up high, would you say, Lord, start a revival in me. Start a revival in my workplace. Start a revival in my household. Start a revival in my prayer life. Start a revival in my worship life, in my devotional life, in my fatherhood, whatever the Lord is impressing upon your heart. I want you to lean into that. Lord, stir up revival in me. I'm no longer praying for it to happen somewhere else. I want it to happen here. No longer praying for revival to start somewhere else at some other church. Lord, start revival here at Crossroads Community Church. I'm done dipping my toes into the pool. I'm ready to dive in head first, Lord. If you're going to start revival, start it in me, Jesus. Mike is going to close us out with this course. Would you make this your prayer? Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Mike, would you lead us in this course? Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the your glory, your God, is what Making my your heart longs for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here, come flood this place and fill the your glory, God, is what my heart longs for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Jesus. One more exercise that I want to do. It's going to require a little bit of boldness. I feel like it would be hypocritical for us to talk about a roar and a roaring church and a church having a voice if we don't pause and just pray out loud for a couple seconds. To my introverts in the room, stay, stay. It'll be over in a second. There's a boldness that comes with praying out loud. It's not only biblical, but there's a boldness that comes with it. So here's what I'm going to ask one more time. Would you bow your head with me? Close your eyes. And for the next 15 seconds, I want to challenge us to pray out loud with authority. Pastor, I don't know what to pray about. Pray over our country. Pray over the division. Pray over your household, your marriage, your relationships, your friendships. But let's do it out loud. Let's let a roar out of this place. Amen, church. Amen, church. I'm going to count to three, and I want us just for 10 seconds to pray with authority and boldness. Are you ready? One. Let's allow boldness to well up inside of us. Come on, church. Two. There's a roar that wants to be let out of this place. Ready? 
three, go ahead and pray out loud. Come on, church. Come on, come on, come on. Jesus, we love you, Lord. Father, would you intervene in our country, in our relationships, Lord Jesus? Would you lead us and guide us? Come on, ten more seconds, ten more seconds. Jesus, would you raise up a generation of God-fearing believers, Lord? May your anointing flow through this grace, Jesus. Five more seconds, five more seconds. Jesus. So, Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for this beautiful gift of prayer that you give us where we don't have to sit here this morning and wonder if you heard us, but we know according to your word, you hear us when we call upon your name, Lord. So, Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for who you are. Now, Lord, I pray that as we leave this place, help us to proclaim truth in love. And God, I pray that we would walk in empowerment, in love, and self-control. Lord, I pray that our prayer lives, Lord, that you would just throw gasoline on the fire of our prayer. Jesus. Now, Lord, I pray once again that you would go before us, prepare the way, open hearts. I ask for divine appointments, that there would be opportunities for us to not only proclaim truth, but shower individuals in love. We leave this all in your hands. Have your way, we ask, Lord Jesus. And everybody said, and everybody said, and everybody said, amen. Hey, I'll see you next week. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today.